Thank you, Amanda. And uh, I must say, Amanda is the one who organises these so beautifully and it's a terrific uh, series of lectures that we have and I think you might also have the list of uh, the ones that we give. It's part of uh, the philosophy of the floor is to uh, transmit the information as much as possible out into the, to the uh, community, which is, which is you, and we get good feedback from you as to what we're doing. So I'm going to talk about uh, research and what uh, but also an overview of stroke because uh, even though every time I go to a lecture about stroke I always like reminding myself about what, it's, what it is. So I'm going to talk about what is stroke, uh, just to refresh our memories. Sometimes it's called the hidden problem uh, of the world and I'll explain why we use that term sometimes. Uh, what are we doing about it even more importantly and I'll put that in the perspective of uh, of my experience uh, as a neurologist for now, I hate to say this, but nearly 40 years, uh, where I've seen, um, I won't say I've seen it all, but I've seen a lot uh, of things come and go, uh, and uh, it's, it's quite a remarkable story. Uh, and uh, also some advice to, to you about uh, stroke. So what is a stroke? This is a cross-section of the, of the brain uh, and uh, these are these big blood vessels that come out right there, uh, each side of the brain, and they've got, uh, the, oops, uh, they've got these uh, very small blood vessels that go deep up into the brain, and one of the forms of stroke, but only about 15%, uh, is a bleed. And these very delicate little blood vessels develop so-called aneurysms, they get thin in the wall and then they just suddenly burst, kaboom. And that's a, a very, very severe form of stroke, about 15%. So a bleed uh, versus uh, the more common form, uh, which is due to a blockage, about 85% is due to a blockage, due to a clot coming from uh, somewhere that I'll show you in a minute. So the, the clot comes up and it's just by, by chance, of course, it goes into bigger ones, uh, naturally, as it goes up through a pipe, it's more likely to go up to a big pipe than a small pipe. Uh, so it goes up this big pipe and stops somewhere here or somewhere here or somewhere back here. And when that occurs, the blood flow stops in that part of the brain. And unless you unblock that, and that's the interesting part, unless you unblock that within a very short period of time, uh, you start to get that brain uh, dying. Uh, and it starts as a tiny little spot and then the, the death just spreads and spreads and spreads. We think over a period of hours where, to be frank, we're not quite sure exactly how long it takes. Uh, and that's one of the uh, conundrums that still uh, exists. Uh, so, uh, sudden blockage or bursting of a blood vessel. Uh, and when that occurs in specific parts of the brain, and I'll explain this more in a minute, if it hits a particular part of the brain, it will cause a certain number of symptoms. And it's always bang. Uh, you're sitting there and this happens in just a microsecond. You feel this sensation or lack of power in part of your body. So weakness and or numbness on one side of the body, that's by far the most common. There are lots of other symptoms, but that is, I'd say, about 80% of it. Numbness or weakness on one side of the body. Or you might suddenly have trouble understanding things. Or your speech might suddenly become quite strange, either very, very slurred or uh, in a very uh, confused sort of way. Or you might suddenly become unsteady. Now, that's only one of the symptoms, and it's we all get unsteady for various reasons it's not a stroke and part of the, part of the difficulty is telling is it a stroke or is it just your inner balance mechan mechanism that's gone a little awry so that's why we don't that's not as common as this one or you get trouble with your eyesight and the one to really watch out for there is when you can't see out of one side uh, just suddenly you can't see anything on one side or you go blind in one eye, bang like that, just for a few minutes or seconds. They're the, uh, the warning signs. Now, what happens when this occurs? Fortunately, about 30%, uh, just under normal circumstances, and I can say that, uh, I'll come to this again in a minute, but w before we had any treatments, 
we knew this, that about 30% would just get better by themselves, uh, sometimes quite quickly, and they'd end up with just very, very minimal symptoms. Just nature, because the clot uh, that had blocked the area, or the little bleed, if the bleed was only small, was all small enough to either the clot dissolve by itself, or the bleed was never big enough to cause much of a trouble. 30% recover slowly and have moderate symptoms, so someone left with a, I'd say, a mild stroke, I'd call it, moderate stroke, or the devastating ones, uh, and that's the, the real problem, is 40% either dead or very disabled. Uh, and that's, uh, I suppose, 10% end up as, as very disabled. So it's only a minority, uh, but uh, again, another 30% are dead. So we've still got a huge amount of work to do to overcome this problem. Now, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, about 15% or so <coughs> of the strokes, you get a little warning. And it's just like the big stroke, except it's occurred in a very brief period of time. So uh, a stroke, is, as you probably know, is in a full-blown form, is most commonly a weakness down one side of the body or the other. Uh, so you get these little mini strokes that might, uh, might only uh, last uh, for uh, a period of uh, minutes uh, and then get completely better. And uh, as you know, there's no pain associated with it. So you might just, let's say, have an episode where you're doing something with your left hand and then suddenly it just drops like that. You're driving and suddenly it just won't work for 10 minutes and you're saying, oh, strange and decide to do nothing about it. Disaster, disaster, disaster. Because that is uh, a so-called transient ischemic attack, uh, which uh, is very brief. Uh, and once that's happened, it's, it's a warning that you are at incredibly high risk of a major stroke occurring within the next minutes, hours, days. Uh, and it's something like the risk is about 30% occurring over the next seven days. So you can imagine uh, when we hear about someone who's had one of these little warning uh, strokes, uh, we get very anxious and want to see people immediately because there are now so many things we can do to prevent it happening. Uh, and prevention is, as we all know, much better than trying to do something after it's occurred. So that's a very, very important thing. And that's a message I've been trying to get across for 30 or 40 years, and it's a, it's a message that's very hard for uh, us to get through to the public how important these uh, little warning uh, symptoms are. Uh, so uh, how do we diagnose? So someone comes in with uh, an episode of weakness down one side of the body and they come into the emergency and I rush down to the emergency, what do I do as a, as a neurologist, as a, a stroke person? Firstly, I talk to the person, take the history, take the history from the family, say what happened, where were they, what were they doing, how did it evolve, did it go like that or has it been there for a week, uh, did it come on slowly, quickly, etc., etc. Uh, and then I examine them and I can tell from the examination exactly, most likely, where the problem is in the brain because we're, we, we learn from uh, a couple of centuries of experience by looking at people carefully to work out exactly where the problem in the brain is because it's caused a certain number of signs to appear in the body. Then, uh, these days, uh, we can do all these images. Uh, CT of the brain, MR of the brain, ultrasound of the arteries and the heart. And uh, if we do a CT scan, uh, which uh, when I first started as a neurologist, we didn't have CT scans. It seemed unbelievable. We didn't have CT scans when I started. So we had no idea whether someone had had uh, a stroke due to a bleed. And the second the second that that bleed occurs in the 15% of strokes that is caused by this, the second you see this white blob, it's anyone can tell. I can teach you to see whether someone's had a stroke due to a bleed. It's there in a moment. Uh, and that's a big one. You can tell, that's half the brain. This dark bit is just the normal uh, 
uh, ventricles of the, uh, the brain, the, uh, uh, the uh, fluid spaces of the brain. But this white thing is a big bleed and that's causing a massive problem. That would be causing weakness on the opposite side of the body for that person. Uh, versus the 85% uh, due to a blockage and that causes this death of tissue you can see here. And on CT scan, it doesn't appear immediately. This would be probably even 24 hours after the event. Slowly you start to see the area of death of the brain. So if I've got someone in front of me with a stroke and I can see nothing, I assume that it's due to a blockage because I'm still waiting for the death of the tissue to be apparent on the CT scan. So the CT scan was a breakthrough because I could see a bleed but I couldn't immediately see the blockage. It would slowly come into view over the next 12 hours until I couldn't believe this when in 1977 they brought in CT scans and I was just starting my neurology training. How lucky was I? How lucky were all you that came in? Uh, so, and then I thought, wow, that's the most amazing advance that's going to occur in my lifetime. <coughs> Ten years later they bring MRI scans in. I thought, how lucky am I? Uh, and uh, when uh, MRI scans came in, we overcame this problem of the CT. This person's, ha person's had a stroke here only three hours beforehand and you can see nothing due to a blockage. But you do the MRI scan and you can see it perfectly. So a revolution occurred when we brought in MRI scans. Uh, so uh, MRI with this, it's the, just you don't have to worry about that. It's just a special type of MRI that can tell you. Again, not quite as quickly as with uh, a bleed, but pretty quickly after as you can tell with an MRI scan within probably half an hour or so as to whether, where the lesion is uh, with a blockage. And that's causing a huge problem with that part of the brain there. Again, are the spaces, the ventricles of the brain there. So then uh, we've established from all of that that the person's had a stroke. And let's say it's due to a blockage and the blockage is usually caused by a clot, as I said, that goes up into the, one of these arteries. This is the brain here, heart here, and the connection, the main highway that we've got between the heart and the brain is the carotid artery system. It's a huge highway. You can feel it. You, just there, you can feel it pulsing away. Uh, boom, 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 pumping all the blood up into the brain here. So where do the clots come from? That is the question. Where do the clots come from? And why do they, why does someone get a clot? Uh, so it can come from the heart. And these days uh, we can do an ultrasound over the heart or down the throat to even get a closer look uh, to see if there's something wrong with the heart, particularly around here with the big aorta where the, the blood is flowing out through this huge artery here. Uh, or it might be up here, is a very, very common place where this artery, about where my finger is, uh, can become very, very narrow. Uh, as we get older and as you've got risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, high cholesterol, smoking, it causes damage to the arteries and you get so-called stenosis, they call it, which just means narrowing. And that narrowing you can imagine the blood's trying to go through the thing and it's all turbulent uh, and as it's becoming turbulent it doesn't like it so it clots and bang it clots and whoosh, up upstairs it goes. Uh, so that's uh, either there or there are the two common spots that clots come from and they can be huge clots, massive. Uh, and they can go kavoom up there and it might stop right there and the whole brain has got no blood on that side, the whole brain. Uh, or it might be quite small and they might come on little dribbles. So they're going right out to the end there and they're just giving you little symptoms, a little numbness, a little weakness just for a few seconds. Uh, but you can imagine uh, that it might be just a dribble at first uh, but then kaboom, the whole thing goes and you've got a massive stroke. Uh, but these days uh, we can look at where the problem is from an ultrasound here, an ultrasound here, and the CT and MRI scan up here in the brain. So we can learn so much about it. And imagine when I was young, 
none of that. So it was just a black box. I had no idea what was going on. In fact, I used to do ward rounds with my consultants when I was just a junior and say, why has that person had a stroke? And they'd say, I don't know, I don't know. And I said, well, why don't we know? Uh, and now, fortunately, we know a massive amount about stroke. So uh, what causes all this damage to the heart and the blood vessels? Uh, firstly, we get a bit older. I'm getting a bit older. We're, we're, we're all getting a bit older. Uh, and as we get a bit older, it does damage the arteries a bit. But just getting old -er isn't enough. You need something else. And usually it's things like having high blood pressure that you're not looking after properly. Uh, or this is huge. You've got an irregular pulse so-called atrial fibrillation. You when you feel your pulse, it should just be like a Rolls Royce. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, and if it's going blah, 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 blah all over the place, it, you might have atrial fibrillation. And that, because the heart is not then beating regularly, like the, the I told you about when it narrows, it all becomes, uh, uh, the, 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 the blood flow becomes disturbed. The same with atrial fibrillation becomes disturbed so that you suddenly get clots forming and upstairs it goes. Or you've got very high blood sugar with diabetes. Or worst of all, you're a smoker. Terrible damage to the arteries, terrible. Or you've got high cholesterol that you haven't uh, investigated or controlled properly. All of these things uh, can cause damage to the arteries and to the heart and increase the likelihood of all of these clots forming and also causing bleeds because it damages those very fine arteries I was telling you about before. So that's the refresher on uh, stroke. Uh, and it's a different refresher that, uh, that I give now than I gave 30 years ago because now we know so much more. Why do we sometimes call it a hidden problem? Well, there are two main reasons. One is uh, it's, it's so hard to get the message across that stroke is a <coughs> massive, massive public health problem. Uh, that that uh, you, you, you talk to government people, you talk to everyone, they say stroke, well, we can do nothing about it. Why are we even worried about it? Well, we can do a lot about it. And there, it is terribly important. It is a massive problem. And they wouldn't listen because they didn't ever measure how important the problem was. But it is huge, as I'll show you. And some strokes you don't even know you've had. Uh, and that's, that's also important. That's why we also call it sometimes a hidden problem. So just some everyday statistics about stroke. It's the second most common cause of death in the world, next to heart disease. Second most common cause of death. In Asia, uh, where I travel a lot, it's in many, many countries, it's the number one cause. In Japan, it's the number one cause of death. In parts of China, it's the number one cause of death. Um, and it's the single most common cause of disability. So when they say, look, this, it's not important because we can't do anything about it, but we say, look at the problem. Look how extensive the problem is. Governments and healthcare uh, people need to take a huge amount of notice of it. In Australia, we have about 50,000 people who have some sort of stroke event every year, 50,000. 140 a day, six every hour, one every 10 minutes. So during my lecture, about six people around Australia are going to have a stroke. Terrible, shocking. Uh, so, and these can be prevented. I would say most of them can be prevented. Uh, and it costs us uh, about two billion per year. But the, the social cost, of course, is outweighs any financial cost in any sort of way. You would think uh, that uh, we would be doing more about it. Think of how we manage heart attacks. Every hospital, every tiny hospital has got a coronary care unit. Has every tiny hospital got a stroke unit? No. Are there more stroke events than heart events? Yes, there are more stroke events than heart, heart events. And this was a terribly important study done by, by my friend Peter Rothwell. Uh, in Oxford, where he took the whole Oxfordshire area and measured 
every, over a period of two years, every single event that occurred, stroke, heart attacks and trouble with the legs uh, due to blood vessel problems. And this is, these are the heart attack events, the frequency, 1.9 <coughs> per thousand per year. So these are the stroke events, 2.27. More stroke events than heart events. Why, 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 why have we, for all of my career, put a fraction of the public resources into stroke compared to heart disease? Why? Probably, I've, I've only got theories about this, probably because when all the, uh, the resources were being allocated back uh, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, most of it was managed by working middle-aged men. Uh, so they were uh, putting things into things that were affecting them. And in those days, middle-aged men were the peak group who were getting heart attacks. And stroke, of course, uh, is shifted a bit uh, older to the slightly older group. So it really starts to come in when you hit 65, 70, 75, 85, etc. Uh, the silent voice in terms of political influence as to where resources go. Uh, I can, that's the only reason I can think of as the most likely. So why else do we call it silent? Uh, well, because in 10 to 20% of the population, uh, you have uh, these little events occurring in the brain, but they're in a part of the brain uh, where it just doesn't impinge upon uh, any pathways that are going to give you a symptom, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but it may cause things like dementia or may make you feel depressed because it's really affecting more subtle pathways of the brain than the more obvious ones that I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, so uh, this also may occur, you can imagine, while you're asleep. About 20, 25 to 30 per cent of strokes occur while people are asleep. Uh, so um, you can imagine if it's a, a very brief one, it'll occur and they'll be better in the morning and no one will know it's happening. But the damage is there. Uh, so that's a terribly important issue and it happens in about 10 to 20 per cent of cases. So it might be just a little one like this, right next to the spaces of the brain that we talked about, where all the water of the brain is, and the water goes around the outside as well. It's mainly designed to cushion the brain so it doesn't get damaged. Uh, so there's a tiny little one uh, that has caused a silent stroke. And this is the, the brain looking side on. Uh, this is your balance section, the, the cerebellum right at the back there, deep in. Uh, makes me able to stand up and coordinate my arms and legs. Uh, this is the back, the visual section, interprets what's come through the eyeballs. Uh, this is the auditory section, so that when you're listening, this is what you're interpreting, this little bit here. Uh, this uh, is the speech area here, so that when my speech output is occurring, uh, that's the bit of the brain I'm using, Broca's area so-called. And there's another area here where you're receiving speech information. And this bit here uh, is, um, right along there is the so-called motor strip because it is all to do with controlling movement. So it tells you to move your fingers, your hands, your arms, your legs, your face, etc. And it runs along a strip like that. And the foot movement is up there and the speech right down to the face down here, hand, etc. And this is the equivalent sensation, hand, feet, face, etc. that you feel, you touch and that is received right there. But you see the rest of the brain in the frontal lobes, in the parietal lobes, in the temporal lobes, no action, no action. Nothing's happening. Apparently, apparently. But uh, you can get damage to these areas and subtle things start to occur. For example, your frontal lobes are all to do with you. It's, it's the head office, it's personality. Uh, and uh, if, you, if your head office isn't working too well, your personality can change. So if you start to get silent strokes up there, you can start to get personality changes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all over the brain that can cause uh, symptoms that are a lot more subtle and a form of dementia, so-called vascular dementia, because you get so many little ones, but they've never ever hit the spots where 
in everyday terms, we can experience it suddenly uh, with vision, with sensation, with movement, all of the things that we recognise as stroke. So that's silent stroke, and that's and we're realising how big that problem is uh, only now. So now that's the background. Now what are we doing about it? Uh, when I started. Uh, in 1977, my first day as uh, I graduated in medicine in 1972 and I started training as a neurologist in 1977. What treatments were available to me uh, when someone came into emergency, a young woman or an older person in front of me, what could I do? That. Zero. Absolutely zero. There was nothing I could do. Uh, and I thought during my career uh, it was pretty unlikely that we would find anything that would enable me to do anything because, well, pe people have been having strokes for, uh, Aboriginals have been here for 40,000 years. And how was I going to expect in my brief career that I was going to be able to find something with my colleagues all around the world to fix it? Cancel my zero. So, to my surprise, staggering when you think of it, the evolution of time over 40,000 years of humanity in this country, uh, that we have come across uh, a situation where after the stroke has occurred, we can now do one, two, three, four, five things. Is that five? Five things uh, that are absolutely proven to improve you once you've had the stroke, if you do the right thing. The first was, uh, <coughs> uh, the fir whoops, whoops. The first one was uh, the introduction of aspirin in 1997, uh, given within 48 hours of the stroke onset. Tiny benefit, but it helps. Within 48 hours, it's just shown in all these trials that if you give aspirin within 48 hours of the blockage type, uh, the infarct type, so-called, uh, then you'll improve the outcomes. Only a tiny amount, but it was something. And this is what we call a uh, number needed to treat uh, to benefit one person. And it's just a statistical way of looking at it. So we've got to treat 83 people <coughs> and 82 of them are going to get no benefit at all, but the 83rd will get a bit of benefit. That's just statistically, that's pretty weak. Next one uh, was uh, the management in a stroke unit. And we set up the first, Australia's first stroke unit in, um, at the Austin Hospital in um, 1978, the year after I started training as a neurologist. And uh, it was shown by my colleague Peter Langhorn in 1993. Uh, I won't go into how he showed it, but he showed that if you manage people in a stroke unit, a bit like a coronary care unit for heart attacks, that you would do, uh, the likelihood of you dying was 20% uh, less. The likelihood of you getting up and walking home was 20% more. Pretty powerful, pretty powerful effect, just by managing people properly in a stroke unit. And it made sense to us, because we set it up when we didn't even have this proof, but it made sense to us that if you do things properly and efficiently and do everything you think you can possibly do to help someone, uh, then everything, w even though they weren't proven, then we're likely to improve <coughs> outcomes that prove to be the case. That was in uh, 1993. In 1995, revolution, uh, that uh, thrombolysis was introduced. Thrombolysis is a clot dissolving agent called TPA. We've been doing trials with them for a few years and they, what they do is they, they just dissolve that clot that's sitting there and you give it into the veins and it works pretty quickly. And you have to give it within a period now of about 4.5 hours after the onset of the stroke because, because it dissolves the clots, it's also a bit dangerous and if you give it too late, we're worried that it'll do so much dissolving it will cause the bleed. So do more damage than good. So we give it only up to 4.5 hours at the moment. But we're working out ways to do it longer than that. Uh, that was a revolution because it improved the likelihood of you getting up and walking home 
after coming in within 4.5 hours by about another 30 per cent. So 30 per cent more people got up and just walked home instead of having quite a disability, if you got them in time. Uh, and at the moment, even though in spite of our best efforts in the best stroke units around the world, the maximum proportion that you can get to is about 20 per cent of people with the blockage type, ischemic stroke, and uh, most only do about 5%. So still a long way to go with that. In, uh, where are we up to? 1997. Uh, in 2007, uh, this, uh, but you can see that the, the effect is more powerful. You only need to treat 18 people uh, to get benefit one. For stroke units, you have to treat 26 people to benefit one. So the effects are getting more and more powerful. In 2007, uh, for a very small subgroup, and this is not a, uh, a common uh, way of dealing with stroke, it's not one we ever want to, but in a very small proportion of case, cases where the stroke is absolutely massive, remember I said you could block the whole half of the brain, when that happens and you can't unblock it, uh, the, the brain starts to swell and it pushes the good brain over onto the side, which is terrible. Uh, so what you do is just take the skull off there and allow the pressure to dissipate. And that has a remarkable effect and then it gradually just comes down again. We only would do it uh, a couple of times a year. So it's not, it's not a very common procedure. But when, it, when you do it, you only need to treat four of those people to benefit one. So getting more and more powerful. And then finally, uh, Amanda was mentioning about this uh, issue uh, that we've just done a trial here and we are I modestly say, among the world leaders doing this procedure, uh, demonstrating that uh, in earlier this year, uh, Bruce Campbell with us at the Royal Melbourne, my friend Steve Davis at the Royal Melbourne and I and others at the Austin, uh, and this group from Holland showed that if you removed the clot, which was one of the great ambitions we had, we could see the clot with these new imaging techniques and imagine how frustrating it is you see someone in front of you, you can see the clot and you know if you get that clot out, and it only happened half an hour ago, if you get that clot out, that person will just get up and walk home. And the alternative is sometimes a life with disability. So you can imagine the drive we had to try to, to get these clots out. So we're always thinking of ways to do it and we think we've finally cracked it. Uh, so time is brain, we always say that. These are just little statistics. I want to go straight on to this bit uh, to just tell you about this. Uh, this is the clot removal device uh, where you, you put a, a, a little uh, catheter in the artery, in the groin. Upstairs it goes to the blockage that I showed you. And this little wire device springs open, grabs hold of this clot, you blow up this balloon just to protect the artery there and then you drag it out. Uh, and then all the blood flows back and the person gets up and walks home. That's if it works perfectly. Uh, and you could see uh, that uh, if we just go back to, uh, to the figures, it is unbelievably powerful. That is one of the most powerful interventions you can get in modern medicine, in any medicine. Treat three people and benefit one of them. That's pretty good. So uh, that uh, has just come in. Uh, it's going to revolutionise how we treat uh, stroke pati patients around the world. It has to, like when we give the clot dissolving agent, you have to do it bang straight away. Uh, the sooner the better. It's for the 25, the 85 per cent have got the blockage type, but not all of those. It's obviously, you have to be able to see the clot and be able to get it out. Uh, but when you can, uh, the effect is absolutely profound. So I, I don't use the word breakthrough lightly, but this, this is a breakthrough, there's no doubt. And we're going to have to, we're going to reorganise how strokes managed in stroke units because they're going to have to come to special centres where this can be done. And this is going to happen over the next few years. So there are all the things we can now do. And as I said, I thought it was uh, pretty unlikely uh, that I'd be seeing anything. And to see that there are so many things going on is, uh, is unbelievable. 
So I emphasise, because we've got so little time uh, to do this, we use this cat's cry, time is brain. It just reminds people that when you have a stroke, you don't muck around, you just go straight to hospital so that you can put these therapies uh, in place. And we, we've done calculations to know that if you, if you have the stroke, you're losing per minute nearly two million neurons. So when I always get very frustrated in the emergency room where people are saying, oh, we'll do it in a minute, I say, no, we're doing it now, 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 now. Two million ne neurons later, if it's your neurons, you wouldn't be saying, I'll do it in a minute, you'll do it now. Uh, there isn't a second to lose. Uh, and this is a graph that's been assembled with, from all the trials. This is the probability of getting up and walking home. Uh, so the probability of getting walk and this is the treatment curve from uh, thrombolysis, the clot dissolving agent. And this is the time after the stroke occurred, out to six hours, uh, three hours, uh, four and a half hours. And you can see, don't worry about these, these, just the red line, the effect of likelihood of getting benefit just goes down and down and down with time. And that white, light, white line means there's no more benefit. So it goes from a lot of benefit uh, to almost no benefit by six hours. And probably by four and a half hours, it's starting to run out. That's why we say time is brain. And it's because those bits of brain are just dying by the second and we need to take the clot out. And what uh, seems to be happening is this is the brain again and this, this is the area of dead tissue and this is the so-called ischemic penumbra. And that penumbra around it is where the blood flow is reduced but the brain is still alive. Uh, so what we, what we want to do is to the dead brain is dead, we can't do anything about it. But the penumbra, which might go right out there, uh, is still alive. And while we know that penumbra is still in place, the treatment is still going to work. So we can now image to see whether there's any penumbra present. We can image to see whether there's any alive tissue, any viable tissue. And this is what it looks like. This is an MRI scan. This is the dead bit of tissue, and then you do another image, and this is all alive tissue. And then you subtract that from that, and you produce this map, and it's like stop, go. This is the dead tissue, this is all alive. But if you don't do something, if you don't unblock that artery, that red is going to spread all the way out there, almost half the brain. If you do unblock it, it won't get any bigger than that. That's, that's the whole aim of this, uh, this approach. And you can see the sophistication now of the tools we've got to be able to work out whether we can treat someone or not treat someone. Obviously, if there was no green viable tissue, then it's too late uh, and we can't do anything. So we're doing a trial. Uh, oh no, this was the trial that I was just describing to you. The Extend IA trial is just the name of a trial. This is where we selected the patients based on this imaging to see whether there was any viable tissue, whether there's any green tissue left, and there was, in which case we would then randomise them to give them just the ordinary TPA to unblock the artery, because we must do that to everyone. But then in those, we then, half of them, we then said, well, let's not only give the clot dissolving TPA, but let's also go in with the device and pull the clot out. And when we did that, uh, that's when we got this, uh, this spectacular result. And this is the, we've now got an automated system, which only takes about five minutes to tell us where the dead bit is and where the alive bit is. And it even tells people whether to, it says randomise here, but it would say treat. So it'd say treat, not treat. It's automated almost so that physicians can do it easily. And this is the, the result of our trial. Uh, you don't need to worry about the technicalities, but this is the scale of someone from dead with a score of six to naught one two is getting up and walking home. And this is the group that we treated with the clot retrieval device. And this is the group that just received ordinary TPA. So 20 dead versus nine. 
52 getting up and walking home versus 28. Wow, huge, huge effect. Needing three people to treat and benefit one. Very, very powerful. This is where we put, this is the top journal in the world uh, with all our colleagues uh, on the paper. So it's had quite an impact. So what's, what it means is that this is going to become standard therapy, as I mentioned. We're going to have to reorganise our whole systems to cope for this because it's, uh, not many people can do it. And we think uh, we, the next step we want to do, my colleague Stephen Davis and I are working on, is let's move, because time is so precious, let's move everything to the community. Let's have uh, ambulances that are a mobile stroke unit and they've other people are thinking along the same lines. We're going to get one here in Melbourne. We're getting funds together for it. There are only two that will probably be the third in the world. So inside, inside the ambulance is a CT scan. How good is that? Wow. Uh, so you rush out with your ambulance. Uh, so instead of having to wait, uh, it's be be like being back in 1977 when you're out in the ambulance because you can't tell, you can't tell. So let's bring, the, let's bring the, the stroke unit out to the people. Let's have the CT scan in the ambulance uh, and pop them in. Uh, we can tell, bang, straight away, is it a bleed or not? Uh, we know exactly what to do and we're going to be able to tell whether it's a blocked blood, blood vessel. And if it's a blocked blood vessel, we're going to be able to use the clot retrieval and they go bang to the centre where that can happen. So this is a very, very exciting uh, development. So that's uh, ischemic stroke, end of story ischemic stroke, uh, the, the commonest cause. What about uh, the other one, the bleeding, uh, the 15% uh, left? Now we're now starting to understand what occurs with bleeding and we've uh, found if you, if you uh, scan from the moment it occurred, remember I said the moment you, you have the scan you can tell bang, it's, it's, it's white. You can see it immediately. And with repeated scans, you can show that it, it grows uh, over the period uh, from, that, that was three hours and six hours, it gets bigger. Three hours, six hours, it gets bigger. Three hours, six hours, just three examples. Uh, how this uh, doesn't just go bang and stop, it might be quite small and then just expand over the next perhaps six hours. So how do we stop that? So you use the, toss the whole problem on its head. In one form of stroke, we're unblocking and using clot dissolving agents and the others, because it's bleeding, to stop it bleeding, you want to first lower the blood pressure, because blood pressure is pushing it out. And also you want to stop it with a so-called hemostatic agent. So instead of a clot dissolving agent, you're using an agent that's making the blood a bit thicker and stopping it ooze out to make the lesion grow. So just like the, the damaged dead area was growing, this bleeding area is growing, we stop the damaged area growing by unblocking the artery, we want to stop the bleeding by making the blood thicker. And that's what we're doing at the moment. So we're trying to uh, work out a way to, we're conducting a trial with a, a blood thickening agent, it seems a strange thing to do, blood thickening agent to see if we can improve outcomes in people who have uh, bleeding. So how far we've come, we've got specially designed drugs for each type of stroke. So this is our stroke unit in 1984. We had some wonderful, wonderful people. Each time I look at that, this I uh, smile of the people we, uh, we had. Chris Rowe, who's now, he was our registrar, is now head of, um, of uh, positron emission tomography at the Austin. Uh, we had physiotherapist, occupational therapist, uh, occupational therapist, social worker, physiotherapist, speech pathologist, all a terrific team that we had back in 1977. And, but I didn't have a photo. This is the first photo I took in 1984. I don't know why I didn't take a photo. It's silly. Uh, so as I was saying before, when you go into a stroke unit, you seem to get a lot better coming out the other side. And we don't quite know why, uh, but you can imagine what it might be. It might be because you control the blood pressure a lot better. It might be because you get people up and mobilise them a lot quicker and we're testing that hypothesis 
as we speak. Or we might treat infections a lot better. We might improve swallowing. We might use earlier medication like aspirin. We might, there are dozens of things that we do that might be just in a, as an aggregate helping people get a lot better than if they just went to a general ward. Uh, so stroke units are essential and fortunately we've now got stroke units in almost uh, every hospital in Melbourne. And it's not only that, uh, I've got this diagram to remind people that by having a stroke unit you, you aggregate, it's a bit like flying a, a, a 707 or a 747 jet, you get a, a, a group of people who really know what, you th what you're doing. You, pilot and co-pilot and navigators know what they're doing, your staff know what they're doing, you, the, the, uh, uh, all the, the, uh, every staff person in the aeroplane knows what to do, like a military operation. It's the same in a stroke unit and of course you do things a lot better. And the things you do is you, you have around it a halo of benefits, so you manage people a lot better when they come in, you manage people a lot better when they go out. And there's sort of a backflow effect. You manage people better in the community because you're an area of expertise that is, say, let's say you have a stroke unit in Wangaratta, then suddenly there's expertise in Wangaratta about stroke and people are teaching people about stroke and people are told to do things to prevent stroke, which we'd much, much prefer than be treating it after it's happened. So it's the so-called halo effect of a stroke unit. And that's probably if you looked at the global problem of stroke, if I said, where am I going to put my money to benefit the globe in terms of stroke, I would say, go out and populate the world with stroke units. That's probably the most cost effective way of doing it. And prevention, as I said, is so uh, much more important. Again, I'd, I could put up the same slide showing what we knew about prevention when I started, zero. This is what we know about prevention now, and it's unbelievable. And starting in 1978, 1987, 1991, 1993, 1996, 2001, 2006, it just keeps coming. Uh, all of these proven ways uh, of preventing stroke. Uh, this is after the first little stroke has occurred, but equally applies to people who, or mostly applies also to people who haven't had a stroke at all. So. Uh, after this, this bit applies to after you've had a little bit of stroke. These are all so-called antiplatelet agents, a bit like aspirin. This is doing an operation on the artery that's too narrow or using a, 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 a device, uh, angioplasty, to unblock the artery. This is for uh, when you've got atrial fibrillation. We used to use warfarin, now we've got new modern drugs. This is another antiplatelet agent. This is a blood, pro blood pressure lowering <coughs> and this is using something to lower uh, the cholesterol. All are proven to prevent a second stroke and a lot of them are proven to prevent a first stroke. Amazing what we know today compared to what we knew before. So finally, uh, have I got any advice? Tiny bit. Uh, that uh, to you and your families. Prevent a stroke. I always said if I had complete control of the world, which would be nice, uh, and I say fix stroke, I wouldn't say spend the money on all these things that I've, we've been doing. I'd say prevent it. Uh, much better to prevent it, but also you've got to uh, look, look after people once they've had it. So to prevent it, lower your blood pressure. Never smoke, or if you are smoking, stop smoking. Why are still drives me to distraction seeing young women, young men smoking? Um, watch your diet, keep your cholesterol low, keep your blood sugar low, exercise, check for that irre irregular pulse. They're the big ones that are going to prevent you having a stroke. And almost every person you see with a stroke, uh, you can say, well, why was it? And you say, well, it was because of X, Y, Z. And, uh, eminently preventable. Treat stroke. Uh, there's, once it's happened, don't muck around. Don't call your doctor. Call the ambulance. Just go, uh, call your ambulance and we've got this acronym FAST, face, arm, speech, time, uh, to help diagnose a stroke. Is the face affected? Is the arm affected? Is the speech affected? And don't waste time. Straight to a major hospital. 
where they'll do imaging, they'll have a stroke unit and they'll put all of those things in place that I've talked about. And after the stroke unit, most people, most people will go home. I mean, it's, it's, it's a good story. The stroke's, stroke is a good story. Rehabilitation and a minority, only about 10% of people uh, will uh, end in a, up in a nursing home. So, uh, this is where uh, things are going. Uh, firstly, we want to prevent it before it happens. Then once it has happened, we want to start the stroke unit out here in the community. And then that tells us whether it's the bleeding type, the haemorrhage, or it's the infarct type, the more common type. If it's the common type, then you can either, you give uh, the clot dissolving or you can pull the clot out, give aspirins, occasionally you do surgery, you certainly manage them in a stroke unit. If it's a hemorrhage, uh, I didn't go into it, but sometimes surgery is uh, effective, but not very. But hemostatic agents, the blood and thickeners may, may be helpful later. But the main thing is, over and over, all of this is no time to waste. It has to be done ASAP. Thank you very much.